Jonathan, I think you're absolutely right that Islam uh, claims to be the true Judaism and the true Christianity. And uh, I think the Quran even says uh, that Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian, but a Muslim. And Jesus' disciples say, we are Muslims. Um, so basically what Islam does through the Quran is to claim that the heritage of biblical faiths is Islamic and belongs to Islam. Now, this apologetic challenge, the claim of Islam that it is the true Christianity and the true Judaism, uh, obviously came as a as a big shock <laughs> to Jews and Christians across the Middle East in the context of uh, a very rapid conquest and dominance, political uh, military dominance. And the the response to that of both Jews and Christians from quite early on was to say that um, Muhammad had been influenced or taught by Christians so or by Jews. So the Jews said, uh, Jews have said that uh, there were some rabbis who found that Muhammad was threatening their people, so they pretended to convert to Islam, and then they they gave Muhammad the Quran and they trained him in 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 kind of biblical beliefs. And there's a Christian version of that which says that a monk called Bahira, or also called Sergius in the Syriac sources, um, uh, taught Muhammad as his disciple, and Muhammad was being discipled, uh, then became heretical and moved away from true Christian faith. So. This has been a really standard view amongst Christians since um, almost since the time of Muhammad. John of Damascus had this view. Um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Luther, Nicholas of Cusa, who was a really great uh, Catholic intellectual from the late Middle Ages. So they all had the view that Islam was um, a kind of heresy. Uh, so the, the the idea of calling something a heresy is a is a claim of continuity with a bit of discontinuity so a heresy is something that develops out of the root but but loses its way or, or goes beyond the pale so this claim that islam was a kind of heresy that muhammad um perhaps uh lost his way a bit or um or moved away from the true faith has been the absolutely completely dominant view um, in, in amongst Christians and also Jews. I mean, it's really striking that both Christians and Jews said that one of their number trained Muhammad. And I, I, I read somewhere that Zoroastrians had the same view that a Zoroastrian trained. Oh, really? <laughs> so this is their explanation. Everyone's trying to claim everyone in every direction <laughs> That's in this right. story, aren't they? Jesus is a Muslim. No, Muhammad is a Christian. And and it, it seems almost like a mirror image. Like, uh, you know, oh, you can't claim our history. We're going to claim yours. Um, and it's it's been such a dominant view. Um, there was a, an Anglican bishop called Kenneth Cragg writing in the middle of the 20th century, and he argued that Muhammad was well-intentioned but had somehow encountered a poor Christianity, so he's turned off Christianity. And he said that Christians have a responsibility to kind of restore Islam to its true Christianity, um, to to retrieve it. So he had this doctrine of retrieval. It's as if you know you've got the the cathedral in Constantinople that became Istanbul, which has been turned into a mosque, and it's as if you should just scrape all the paint off and restore it back to a church. So this has been the mainstream view of Christian scholars in dealing with Islam that Islam is 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 a continuous development, but has lost its way, and it can somehow be brought back. Um, and uh, I, I find that actually really challenging and and deeply deeply problematic. Just following off on from that, could you tell us a little bit about what some of the explanations are that have been offered in the academy? So if we just move away from, from Christians and Jews for a moment, they I mean, obviously some Christians and Jews have worked on this in, in universities, but irrespective of the religious background or presuppositions of the scholars, because this is a this is a widely acknowledged problem or challenge, what you refer to in the book as the challenge of relatedness. So what what are some of the the theories that scholars have advanced uh, recently or maybe even further in the past to explain how so much biblical content ended up in the Quran? Yeah, I, I, just before delving into that, I mentioned what I call the riddle of the relatedness. That is that there's a lot of material um, in the Quran which is biblical, but there's also r- remarkable ignorance so the Quran seems to clearly portray Mary as the as the same person as Miriam of the Old Testament, that is the the sister of Moses and Aaron, um, and uh, in a number of places. And you get strange um, 
combinations of timing that don't work, like Haman, who was in the story of Esther, is put into as the as an assistant of Pharaoh. Um, but how could someone who had been a Christian or even discipled as a Jew not know that um, Jesus was not the nephew of Moses? You know, how could you not know that? Um, and there are other puzzles as well. That is, most of the biblical material in the Quran is Old Testament, but the theology of Islam is much more Christian. So. Um, the teachings about Satan are more similar to the New Testament. Um, teachings about the afterlife, heaven and hell and judgment and, and intercession for the dead as well. So there's the, that's another puzzle. These puzzles are really problematic. So in the 19th century, a Jewish scholar wrote a, a study of, of the borrowings that Muhammad had taken from Judaism. So this has been a, a common view that Muhammad was deeply familiar with Christianity and Judaism and he borrowed from it. He took these sources in, in forming his religion. In, in recent times, there's been an emphasis on the community, or the Quranic community, and understanding how it could have functioned. And I think a widespread view is that it was influenced by Christianity. So the surahs of the chapters of the Quran are like influenced by Christian liturgy, um, that Muhammad took Christian texts. And I mean, one view is that there were Syriac texts that were sort of just read as if they were Arabic, and that's where the Quran has come from. Um, so there's been a lot of emphasis on the, uh, the, the, the milieu of the late a, a period of late antiquity and how there was a mixing of ideas and influences. There is a consensus, isn't there, that there were Jewish tribes living in the Arabian Peninsula at this time and some Christians or at least trade and cultural connections. Yeah, it's very clear that there were, there were Jewish uh, groups in, uh, in Arabia and also there were Christians. In fact, certain tribes of Arabs had converted to Christianity. These are more around the margins, closer to the Byzantines, but there was a strong Christian presence. And we have rock inscriptions, Jewish and, and Christian rock inscriptions that, predate, that are in Arabic that predate the appearance of Islam on the scene. But there's just puzzles abound, you know. Um, the relationship of Islam to idolatry is really unclear. It doesn't, you know, the story... One of the big problems is this, that the story the Quran seems to tell is different from the story that Islamic tradition tells. Islamic tradition, which is the biography of Muhammad and traditions that Muhammad were that are passed on from what Muhammad did and said, was sort of formalized uh, two or three hundred years after Muhammad. But scholars, the deeper they look into the relationship between the Quran and the Islamic explanation for the Quran, which is you know the heart of Islamic faith. Uh, the more you see discrepancies between those two. So that's a, that's, you know, it's the, the deeper you go into this puzzle, the more puzzling it becomes. And some people have even said in the last 20 years that the scholarship on the Quran is in a kind of chaotic and unclear uh, point of period, point in time, because there are so many conflicting things to explain. I mean, some have said that Muhammad was influenced by Jewish Christianity, by Jews who were followers of Jesus, and that explains the hybrid mixture of Christian and Jewish perspectives. I don't find that compelling, but it's an example of um, how how scholars have, have wrestled with the problems of the origins of the Quran. Your answer to this nexus of problems is that the Quran, I'm just repeating this, the Quran is a creative theological innovation which repurposes biblical lexical and textual materials to serve its own distinctive theological agenda. Now, the the methodology for getting here is really, really interesting because you draw on your expertise and deep learning as a linguist. And you draw out a lot of what I find really helpful conceptual distinctions. And one of them that you draw from ling linguistics is this distinction between inheritance and borrowing in when it comes to language contact. And you've drawn an analogy here with theological contact or religious um, contact. Just as a, an entree into your answer, because it's quite sophisticated and we can't just do it quickly, uh, could you explain the difference in linguistics between inheritance and borrowing and its relevance as you see it to try to unravel this riddle, as you've called it? in Islam yes. and Christianity. Well, the great linguist Ferdinand de Saussure um, pointed out that language is characterized by structure. There are structural relationships between words. In, in, you see it in morphology, in syntax. And um, the study of that structure is a core part of the study of linguistics. 
So when languages change over time, the structure uh, changes gradually. It, it, it's you can get small additions and but it but it maintains its structural coherence over time. So for example, you can take say the morphology of the 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 the, 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 the rules of formation of words in Italian and trace them back in a continuous development to, to Latin. Um, and indeed when considering whether languages are related to each other, you know, is English related to German? Well, it is. How do you know? Because you can trace the structure of English grammar and word systems and morphology back to a shared origin, which is called Proto-Germanic. Now, when you have inheritance in languages, there's structural continuity. Um, something is, is retained in the whole system. The system is, is what evolves. But when you have borrowing, you take an element out of one system and you insert it into another. So that means that it, it, it loses a lot. It's, it's broken out of its original context. Its, it's meaning, its, its forms are, are reinterpreted. Um, just a trivial example, you know, alcohol, the al in that, I think, is originally the, the word for the definite article, the, in Arabic. But in English, it's just part of the word. So what was a, a marker of a structural piece within Arabic grammar has now been lost and it has a completely different function in English. So borrowing characteristically is destructive of structural relationships. And the question then I then I, I began to ask about the Quran is if the Quran has developed from the Bible, what is the system or the structure that would be retained in that inheritance relationship? Or if it's been borrowed, what is what has been destroyed? And my, my suggestion was that the analogue of linguistic structure, morphology, syntax, semantics, is theology. Theology meaning an interconnected set of ideas that link together and make coherent the, the, textual, the text of the Quran. And I ask, is biblical theology, has it evolved into Quranic theology, or is Quranic theology rather um, a new creation that, that opportunistically repurposes biblical elements but it doesn't show signs of of um a, a development over time from a biblical theology you know if to put it another way if muhammad had been a disciple of christianity or judaism he should have been formed in a biblical or, or, or jewish theology that would have somehow showed up in his what he created with islam and in making that that comparison um, I used a few metaphors to help. One was linguistic. But before I talk about the linguistic metaphor, let me give you another one from building. Um, it, 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 there's two ways in which you can change a church or a synagogue and turn it into a mosque. One is you can paint over it, add an extension. That's a kind of continuity development. The basic structure or system of the building is retained. The other way is just demolish the building and reuse the building materials to, to form a completely different building. And if you did that, someone could come along and see, oh, yeah, I recognize that. That's from the church. Oh, there's another bit. That, oh, that's from the synagogue. Um, but the structural relationships of those parts in the building bear no connection to their original um, placement. Uh, so the lintel over the door might be a, a post somewhere else. In fact, there are mosques uh, that in which the pillars are all of different sizes in the mosque because they've been taken from a wide variety of different churches. So my question then is, is, is Islam an extension of a church or synagogue or is it rather a whole new thing built out of materials that have been taken? And then I use um, a linguistic analogy. And the, the problem is, I mean, this conceptual problem is there's just so much biblical material in the Quran. I mean, the most frequently mentioned person in the Quran, I think 136 times, is Moses. And the next is um, Abraham. Muhammad is mentioned by name just four times in the Quran. So what, what is all this material? And I use the analogy of what are called Creole languages. So let me give you an example is Haitian Creole. It's a French-based Creole in the sense that um, its, its vocabulary comes from French. It arose in the slave plantations of Haiti, where Africans from different tribes in West Africa were put together 
and they began to speak the language of their masters, which became Haitian Creole. But what's really interesting about Haitian Creole and other Creoles as well, like Tok Pisin in Papua New Guinea, is that their grammar and their sound system, their morphology, their structure is like the languages that, that the, of, of, of the um, workers in the plantation. So the, the grammar of Haitian Creole is like West African languages. So you could translate Haitian Creole like form for form into some of those West African languages. Um, but the lexicon has been taken from f- French. So there's been this vast borrowing from French to create Haitian Creole. But its grammar, its worldview, its in heart, its heartbeat, if you like, is purely West African. And the terms that are used for that is that the substrate are the West African languages and the superstrate is French. And you get a kind of marrying of these two together. The, 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 the deceptive thing about this is that when a French speaker encounters Haitian Creole, they tend to think of it as a kind of degraded form of French. It's kind of odd French. And just as Tok Pisin feels like pidgin English, you know, a form of English, um, and I think that's what Christians and Jews have seen when they've encountered Islam. They say, oh, this is Christianity or, or Judaism, but sort of distorted. But actually, from a linguistic point of view, Haitian Creole is not considered to be a variety of French. It's not, it's not a, one of the Romance languages descended from Latin. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole new creation. It's a, um, and the, the linguistic contact is you've got the language of the masters and the language of the plantation workers has come into contact and it's produced in the children of those plantation workers. It's produced a whole new language. Um, this has happened again and again in different places around the world. So I said, maybe Islam is a Creole religion which has repurposed elements from Judaism and Christianity, um, but its actual theology is different. It hasn't inherited the system, which is the theology of Judaism and Christianity. So then I said, let's identify a number of key doctrines or teachings of the Bible and ask what happened to those in the Quran or look at elements in the Quran which are connected to the Bible and say, do these have any biblical theology left, you know, or, or, or has it been completely reconstructed? 